Welcome back to... <laughs> Sorry. It's a little cluttered in here today. Apparently the set for some new show is getting built in here. But it doesn't matter. All I really need for a Cinema Snob episode is just a chair, a Caligula poster, and Charles Bronson killing hundreds of people. Bad news, people. It's still not a good idea to be a relative or a close friend to Paul Kersey. Take care of my things, will you? Till I can back. But on the plus side, crime no longer exists. With the remake of every vigilante movie that isn't Death Wish coming out, it's time that we spotlighted the 1985 sequel Death Wish 3. It's very different from Death Wish 2, because they decided to ditch Roman numerals on the grounds that Canon Films feared half of Americans couldn't read Roman numerals. That's bogus. That didn't stop any of us from saying two for Rocky IV. While architect Paul Kersey has no family left to avenge, don't worry, they made up a friend for him to avenge this time. It was very necessary to do this, since Death Wish 2 was a big hit in 1982, and director Michael Winner, who also directed the first two Death Wish films, needed a surefire hit after the box office disappointments of The Wicked Lady and Scream for Help. Michael needed justice for the streets and justice at the box office. In a world gone mad, there is only one law. His. Murphy's Law. Oh, wait, that's a different Charles Bronson movie. With Charles Bronson being one of Canon Group's most lucrative stars, it made sense they'd want him to square off against a pack of angry lions. <laughs> And to get funky! Charles Bronson, who rarely did interviews, was fairly open about his disappointment in this film, and judging from his expression, I sure can't tell. His eyes are open, but I'm not so sure he's awake. Boost up the soundtrack! The music sounds like a test track for a Death Wish TV series. Sorry, movie, but you know I'm Team Juicy Fruit. Paul Kersey is on his way back to New York after cleaning up the streets of L.A., despite the first film ending in Chicago. Guess the new one fills in the blank on that. There's something about the music, the style of credits, and the camera work that... I don't know why, but I feel like this movie is going on at the exact same time as this. The film was produced by Yeah No Fucking Shit and written by Don Jacoby of Life Force and Blue Thunder under the pseudonym Michael Edmonds. <laughs> well, that's a good sign. Oh, damn it, we're late! Someone's already destroyed the neighborhood! See, this is what happens when we let the punk Muppets into Sesame Street. This is an alternate universe where they didn't have a rec center and break into Electric Boogaloo. Not only are they fucking with Sesame Street, but that Bob is sure gonna get his! This isn't a very good Bronson movie. Normally, he would have just shot these punks right through the phone. Quick, wake up Alex Winter while he's killing time waiting for Bill and Ted to be made! I like how most of the movie's trivia is Alex Winter talking mad shit about it. Now they're off to set fire to Oscar's garbage can. You know they're getting a little ahead of themselves when Paul Kersey's loved ones are getting fucked up before they even have any scenes together. Charlie? Cut! You're Charlie! Oh my god, what happened? We were so close, you and I, even though you've never been mentioned in this series. Move in your dead asshole! He's dead. The son of a bitch killed him. It's about time the cops showed up in this series. Paul is getting the John Rambo treatment. Brian Dennehy is gonna pay for this. Chief. Who's this dude? 
like you've never used the word dude in your life. Dude, you're in big trouble. Stop saying that! Bronson looks like he doesn't even know what character he's playing. I know you. Kersey. It's Paul Kersey. Oh, right. I'm Paul Kersey this time. Didn't know if it was this or a 10 to Midnight sequel. It's like Beverly Hills Cop if Axel and Mikey never had a scene together before he was shot and Axel looked like he didn't give a shit. But we still have the scene where the cop punches our hero. And I'm the law. That means I get to violate your constitutional rights. <laughs> I don't know if this guy's very good at his job. Why are they wasting so much time on Paul Kersey when apparently there's a murderous horse on the loose? I think I know which of the prisoners is going to overact. Looking for trouble, man? <laughs> Who that'll teach you to get caught stealing scenes? Paul is already making friends. <laughs> Fantastic. Now another one of the Lost Boys is after him. Kersey immediately needs to be taught a lesson. He may not have said any joke about Fraker's reverse mohawk, but he was thinking it. Gang leader Fraker makes bail, and the cops are deaf. If they hadn't have broken us up, I would have killed you. Next time, you won't even see me coming. I think that counts as a threat, Griff Tannen. Makes sense he made bail. Eric Thawbauer was needed on set for Willow ASAP. And in case you didn't know this was a B-action film, Ed Lauder's character's name is Inspector Schreiker. Well, there's nothing been said here. What's the bail? Bail? There is no bail. What are the charges? There are no charges. Stay out of this one, Miss Davis. Why? It's her job. Schreiker isn't letting out Kersey, even though they still haven't found the damn horse yet. Turns out Schreiker is a huge fan of Paul Kersey and thinks he can use vigilanteism to his benefit. I'll minimize the vigilante stuff for the press. Tell them it's creeps killing creeps. Nobody cares anyway. It'll be just like before, Mr. Vigilante. With one important difference. You're gonna work for me. Seems legit. You sure this movie is 90 minutes? It should only take five minutes for this guy to be fired. You're letting me loose? I'm letting you loose. I told you it was a bad idea to make Ollie North a police captain. Stupid 1980s! Meanwhile, at New Year's Evil, the gangs all come together to honor Ash Wednesday. They may be bloodthirsty criminals, but at least they found Jesus. A lesson was learned from the second film. No! <laughs> I could do without the human sacrifice, though. Hard to know what's going on with Paul since there's a Jerry Springer episode going on in the background. Deborah Raffin plays Catherine, the public defending love interest. Not a great idea, lady. Have you seen what happens to everyone he knows? It takes Paul mere seconds to stumble upon a crime. <laughs> this feels like an action movie that's taking place on a musical set. Dig these lyrics. Yo, bitch, come hey, here. I want to eat you. Yeah. Come on, 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 come Fuck Charlie. Both Martin Balsam and Paul knew Charlie during the Korean War when Charlie was Shoeless Joe Jackson. They hit the old people up here in the projects. You know, what goes on out there is a disgrace. Well, then perhaps you shouldn't have tried killing Mitchell. He would have helped you through this. The gang makes it very easy for Paul. He doesn't have to waste time looking for them. They all remain within 50 feet of him. Perhaps they should be more worried about the sun. It's nighttime on one side of the building, but over here it's morning. Eh, his dead friend isn't doing anything with the apartment, so Paul decides to stay in it himself. Another plot point remade by a Bruce Willis movie. Too bad about that damn ruckus. <laughs> Of 
any minute now they're gonna burst out singing what do you do with a BA in English? I guess they've been watching the gang for several hours, but the way the sun works here, this could only be a few minutes later. As he rents a safety deposit box from Borat, he also buys a used car that will be perfect for vigilante movie bait. And I don't know if we need the scene that shows Charles Bronson's lunch break. And uh, he was admiring your dinner. Stuffed cabbage. Smells wonderful. Would you like to join us? Sure. Why is he more expressive about food than his dead friend? And for dessert, pain. It's my car. How are you going to die? Bronson usually delights his dinner hosts with his spot-on Bernie Getz impression. Don't know who this guy is, but damn, the not-equal-to gang is harsh. Now to take down the apartment building for batteries not included. Have you seen the incorrect way they make cheeseburgers? Bronson is really making a difference. Hey, let me five dollars, man. Hey, I said let me five dollars, sucker. Well, someone's lost on their way to the Marcy X set. He's really regretting exchanging phone numbers with Fraker. What are you doing in there? I'm taking care of Charlie's things. That's what I'm doing here. Uh, Charlie don't need no help. Are you still talking about your dead friend, or is this just some cute third-person speak? He finds evidence of the most obvious break-in ever, so he decides to home alone the shit out of his apartment. Why doesn't Shriker just arrest the gang leader? He's got a cleaner arrest record than you. Perfect citizen. When he does something, he does it privately. Yeah, except that time when we met him in prison and he openly threatened Kersey's life. Paul was right to ditch the leather jacket when Catherine shows up. Not sure she'd still be interested in him, despite everyone close to him dying. Mm, she's gonna die by being stared at to death by a dipshit with a stupid haircut. The cops come in to take their guns from my cold, dead hands, which means we have to kill them. Listen, we'll come in here anytime we like. You got that? This remake of The Pianist is stupid, but it leads to more Home Alone traps. Anybody opening the window raises the nail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a bear trap would work just fine. Back to the writer's room. I've got a great idea. Let's serve him a bowl of shit. Good news, though. The trap works. What are those? Teeth. Excellent. You knocked out the window washer's teeth. Are you happy? It's not often I make a reference and it actually comes true. Look. Even this movie would rather be watching Beverly Hills Cop. Ooh, someone remembered his birthday. Gift on loan from Sudden Impact. Some drama turns up. Bronson doesn't know what to do. He's not used to one of the other characters having a loved one who is raped and murdered. How's my wife? Can I see you? Mrs. Rodriguez has expired. Thanks, Dr. Bedside Manor. Save some of that emotion for talking about Charlie. Ah, uh, good, we're back. There's still plenty of people left to kill. Ooh, never mind your dead wife. Death Wish 3 is on. Fuck that, what else is on TV? How about we just reenact the bullet scene from The Exterminator? Something is delaying him killing the rest of the gang. Well, I think I'll go down the street and get myself some ice cream. Well, we saw him have dinner. Might as well watch him have dessert. A dessert that's dipped in grand theft murder! <laughs> That'll hold up in court. Best wait till morning to call in the body. He isn't going anywhere. This dead body is such great news. How are things around here? Better. I feel more relaxed. It's gotten quiet around here. Our efforts must be having a positive effect on the community. We're getting fewer complaints. Right? Tomorrow we're going to start shooting jaywalkers. When he's not busy shooting the breeze. 
I made chicken. I hope you like it. It's the only thing I know how to make. Chicken's good. <laughs> I like chicken. You just had dessert! He starts talking about his dead wife. Nothing about his dead daughter. Probably because the dead wife movie was way better. The acting was way better, too. Damn it, people have got to start to fight back and hard. The whole thing is just... it's out of balance. Eh, hmm. Something about this girl seems crazier than even the street gangs. Tell me. You don't really like opera, do you? Well, now I know where she got the sugar for that tea. Is it time yet for World War Stupid? Just shoot him! Nothing stops you from shooting anyone in this film! Or just kill that guy, whoever that guy is. <sighs> Bronson doesn't bleed blood. Bronson doesn't bleed anything. Doesn't matter if there was a vest there or not, nothing hurts Charles Bronson. Not even a plant. <laughs> I think Paul may be running out of weapons. Jesus Christ, it's Charlie fucking Bronson! And when you run out of plants to drop... <laughs> what a dummy! There's a bit of a problem, though, as Schreiker breaks the news that too many people are dying. It isn't finished. It's like killing roaches. You have to kill them all, otherwise what's the point? It's like if Miami PD hired Dexter knowing that he was a serial killer. However, Martin has a secret weapon that isn't the grenade randomly sitting on his table. That's a 30 caliber Browning machine gun. Charlie brought them home from the war, and they still work. Excellent! We can start handing those out to our nation's teachers! You've had this the whole time. Another reason this movie should only be five minutes long. Anyway, what are you up to, crazy face? I'm leaving the city. Okay, bye. I said bye. I'm hungry. How about you? Okay, fine. Get something to eat first. It's been minutes. It's become pretty obvious that Michael Winner was also a food critic. Even more obvious than when Disco was mostly about Reggie bars. Yeah, good. Leave her in the car. You two are the only people in this city who don't see this shit coming. Come on! <laughs> well, I'll give the gangs this. They're getting more creative. Gee, crime really seems down from the first movie. Sure glad you're here, Paul. I'd like to think that that's unrelated. This is all just a setup for the spin-off film, Balsam of Steel. Don't get too sad, folks. They don't really kill Martin Balsam, but they sure do fuck up his stuntman. See, I told you he was alive. He's there for a broken heart over losing the stuntman. Though not as sad as the gang's loss of that guy. They killed the Giggler, man. They killed the Giggler! What? Not the Giggler! He was my favorite Batman villain! Relax, Paul. You can still kill hundreds more people. I only lost one gun for you there. The other one's still there. In the same place. Blow the scum away. America! Fuck yeah! Part of Charles Bronson's criticism of the film is that they took mild-mannered architect Paul Kersey and turned him into Rambo First Blood Part 2. I can't imagine what he's talking about. Perfect, Paul. You shot three gang members and ten people just leaving from the store. Two of those people were just auditioning for fame. Little does Paul know that most of these people are just celebrating a Super Bowl victory. But Paul's got some help this time. <laughs> well, I'm no longer selling encyclopedias in that neighborhood. I don't think anyone is going to do anything anymore on this street. Ah! 
there was a baby in that car. You're just making the gang angry. <laughs> Thank God you saved us, Paul. Where Death Wish 3 ends, the Road Warrior begins. It really helps the gang when you just walk into the bullets, and when the cars just explode themselves. I don't know, this movie's starting to get awfully violent. It's hard to tell who the heroes are. <laughs> With that, Disney World's NRA land closed immediately. Stupid criminals, if you kill the old people, how can they give you money? More people that Paul has saved. I don't think you have a high enough body count yet, movie. <laughs> Death Wish 3 is considered to be a cult classic, and in the last 20 minutes of this film, <laughs> you can kind of see why. I owed you that one, dude! And stop saying dude! Is this really a city? Are you sure this isn't just the world's most intricate shooting range? Given how everyone owns a fucking shotgun, how did the gangs take over? Never mind assault on Precinct 13, this is assault on every precinct! Oh, are you finally gonna kill this guy? You probably should have done that earlier in the movie. To spare the elderly people getting set on fire! <laughs> Great! So all three of them are now dead! Just kidding. Bronson shielded him with his Bronson. Best get out of here, Paul. What I did would get me life in prison. So long, Paul. The place looks exactly like it did at the beginning of the film. Job well done, 80s human tornado. Then Paul is off to get more people killed and avenge them. While the film didn't make quite the same box office as the first two Death Wish films, it still brought in $16 million against a $9 million budget. The movie was not only controversial for its over-the-top violence, and being the perfect movie for anyone who's ever wanted to fuck a gun, but the video game adaptation was controversial too, considered to be one of the gorier of its time. The combined success of the box office, rentals, and video game sales made them feel safe about doing another sequel two years later with Death Wish 4 The Crackdown, which then led to Death Wish 5 and the Death Wish remake from the director of No Good Movie Ever. Thankfully, movies like this have convinced me to never go outside again. Either I'll get raped and murdered, or a stray bullet from a vigilante will hit me. Doesn't really matter, though. I was planning on staying inside anyway, and just watching porno spoofs for the rest of my life. Yeah! Right on, man! Rock, rock, Sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash stoned gremlin productions. Follow us on Twitter at the cinema snob or check out our homepage at the cinema snob.com.